All right, I just got my cue. Uh, my name is Neil Letson, and I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, this uh, webinar is part of a series of free webinars offered to you monthly by the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and by the UT Residential and Community Forestry Working Group. And our intent is to try to bring you a diverse range of topics, issues, uh, whatever that affects how we all take care of our urban forest in Tennessee and even beyond, and uh, to help us become better stewards of this natural resource. Now, today's webinar is a little bit different than the ones we've had before, which have covered technical or management type topics or boricultural topics. This one's focused on uh, financial resources that are available to communities to help them plant trees. And in particular, it's gonna cover Tennessee's Agricultural Enhancement Program and that little sliver of the program that sets aside money to communities to plant trees uh, to improve the quality of life uh, for people that live there. And uh, let me just say something about this before we turn it over to our speaker, Diane Warwick. Uh, I've had a little experience in grant programs on both ends, applying and also awarding grants. And I just wanna give you a little bit of tip before Diane gives her talk. Uh, the most successful request for funds uh, for any grant uh, is to know what's in it for the awarding agency. And Diane's gonna cover that. So the more you know what's in it for Tennessee, the Division of Forestry, the better able you'll be able to match your objectives with them and to achieve or to accomplish a project that benefits everybody's issues. So you need to pay attention uh, on what she has to say. And as I said, what's in it for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. Now, um, Christy, do I need to introduce the speaker? I, I apologize to y'all that we're kind of ad-libbing here, but uh, is it time to introduce the speaker or do I need to give any housekeeping? No, that's it. It's time to introduce Diane. Okay. <laughs> hey, we, we don't rehearse these things. Uh, we kind of go with the flow. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker, Diane Warwick, who is the Urban and Community Forestry Program Coordinator for the State of Tennessee. She works with the Division of Forestry. Uh, she's got a heart for trees, for people, and that shows in everything she does. She's very knowledgeable, very smart, and she's going to talk to us about the uh, Tennessee Environmental Agricultural Environmental Enhancement Program and how you can participate. Okay, thank you, Neil. I'm going to go ahead and I appreciate everyone attending today. And if there's any questions, we're going to have time at the end. Um, you will probably have questions as I go along and then I may answer them, you know, the further I get into that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my video and share my screen. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Yes, All right. Good. Thank you. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture Forestry Division. This is the TAPE grant. We call it the TAPE grant, Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program. And this is for urban uh, tree planting. And it, uh, 2015 statistics showed that 66.9% of the people that live in Tennessee live in urban areas. And uh, you know, and I know, and every time we drive down the road, we're seeing more land conversion, uh, more loss of our native uh, areas, rampant development, you know, leading to the loss of thousands of trees every year. And, you know, developers and contractors, they, they tend to think about the money first and they come in and they scrape the whole property and then they start uh, you know, designing the project, but we really need to practice forward thinking, you know, instead of scraping the land bare and then constructing bioswales or retention ponds, we need to be using our existing vegetation 
you know, for these purposes where and when we can. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide. Diane, try clicking your screen and then advancing. Thank you, Christy. There we go. So the goals and the objectives of this community tree planning grant is not to provide beautification. We all know that trees are workhorses of our community. You know, they provide energy savings um, and lower temperatures through shading. They provide stormwater mitigation and rain interception through absorption and infiltration. They decrease erosion and overland flow and improve the quality of uh, air by particle interception. Also, they provide clean water. Um, one of our foresters who's moved into this area, I heard him say that every faucet is connected to a forest. And so if you look at that picture in the center, I live down in the holler on the side of a hill and it's mostly forested. And this was the heavy rains we had in March, 2019. A lot of areas in West uh, Knoxville flooded heavily. And this was the rainwater coming down from the forest along the side of my gravel road. This is a ditch. And it looks like a, a stream in the smoke. It was just a perfect example of where that water, you know, that clean water, if it's filtered through the forest. And so the reason that we are interested in increasing the urban uh, tree resources in our cities and towns Number one is heat. Um, heat is the number one weather related killer in the US and the hottest days, particularly days over 90 degrees are associated with dangerous ozone pollution levels that can trigger asthma attacks, heart attacks and other serious health impacts. And so this is just a, an image that I took from Climate Central. They did a study of 60 of the largest cities in the US and Memphis and Nashville were actually in that study. And so you can see that um, the cities are obviously hotter than rural, rural areas and their city summers are hotter, an average of 3.6 degrees hotter in Nashville and 3.4 degrees hotter in Memphis in the summer than in those rural areas. And they also score uh, more days above 90 degrees each year than the nearby rural areas. And then this is just showing a, an image of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, excuse me, it's Louisville, Kentucky. And those urban heat islands are even more intense at night. Over the past 10 years, our average summer overnight temperatures were more than four degrees hotter in cities than in those surrounding rural areas. And so uh, there's a lot of technology that's been developed to help um, delineate those areas in your city that are lacking that tree cover. There's also a lot of uh, hardware applications that can address what they call tree equity. And we all know that the poorer neighborhoods are generally the neighborhoods are lacking in that tree canopy. So you can actually use these tools to uh, identify possible planting areas in your city and the possible planting areas that you're going to get the best bang for your buck. So I'm talking about all the benefits of trees um, to our environment, our water, our air, you know, but trees also improve our physical and our mental health and promote healing. So um, if you're interested, just Google healthy trees, healthy lives, and you can learn a whole lot about how trees care for our health. So into the meat of the Tate Planting Grant, it's called a 50-50 cash, cash match grant, but there is actually no upfront money involved. Um, if you have a project and you um, anticipate that project is going to cost $2,000, when it's all said and done at the end of the year, at the end of the grant period, you have paid uh, the bill for the $2,000, 
then we will reimburse 50%, which would be, for example, the $1,000. So it is a grant with the state of Tennessee and it involves a contract. And so all these procedures are put in place to ensure that we are efficiently and effectively using taxpayer dollars. <clears throat> Excuse me. So all those approved expenses, which I'm gonna tell you what they are, will only be reimbursed when the project uh, invoices are sent to the division. And that is um, the invoices must have already been paid and the proof of payment is required before we reimburse. So our eligible grantees are cities and towns, community organizations, schools and universities, um, nonprofit organizations. Some examples of past grantees have been White Station High School Partners in Education in Memphis, the Garden Club of Nashville, and Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Knoxville. And that's actually uh, that church. When I spoke of the flooding in March, 2019, uh, it is along a creek and they could not access the church. Uh, the, the, the road to the parking lot was inundated. And then the eligible uh, expenses for reimbursed are obviously the cost of the trees. And if your city or town does not have a parks and rec department or um, you know, people who plant those trees, then the cost of contracted tree planting. And we say the cost of mulch, but I actually am not really fond of that dark mulch. It tends to form a crust and it gets hard. And then when the rain comes, it just rolls off and it doesn't really soak in. So I, actually advise composted leaves, pine straw, pine bark, some other uh, material that's going to allow that water to soak into your root zone. And then we do uh, require that those trees are irrigated for the first three years. So irrigation devices and then if you are um, developing an arboretum or you already have an arboretum, we can uh, cover the cost of the tree labels. And then the cost of the sign. So if you look in the top right, that's a sign from Trees Knoxville, one of the tape grants that they applied and successfully uh, were awarded. And that's just a little, you know, like vote for such and such, you know, it's just a little kind of temporary sign. And so we realize these things really don't last very long. And so if you have a permanent sign that you wish to put, you know, at your park or wherever, that's fine. But if, if not, um, we're now allowing you to just go ahead and use that blanket statement and that acknowledgement statement and post it in public places and on your websites. And then finally, if if our proposals exceed our available funds, then we're trying to uh, fund as many projects as possible. So maximum grant funds will be topped for irrigation devices at $15 and $150 for signs. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have also, uh, for example, last year, I had too many projects and not enough money. And some of them I were able to negotiate with them and say, hey, maybe you can, you know, on the website, these irrigation devices are like half the price of what you said you're going to buy them, you know, and I negotiate with folks. And I was like, you know, if you could get that cost down, you know, by ever how many dollars, then I was able to fund more projects and people worked with me and they actually did that. So I appreciate it. And so the Title uh, VI training is recommended for all grant recipients. Generally, folks who work in cities and towns um, must have that Title VI training. Um, but you know, some of the nonprofit organizations, for example, the Garden Club of Nashville, they don't have any hired personnel. They don't have an office. You know, it's just four ladies who are concerned. 
Um, but it is important that we uh, make sure that we are not um, discriminating against anyone. So that Title VI training right there, uh, you can take it for free. And that is the website. And um, it's actually pretty short and sweet. It, it sounds like it may be painful, but it's really not. So I'm gonna talk about the format for proposals and application. And, and these are some of the questions that you can expect on the application itself. And so number one is what is the purpose of the project and what do you hope to accomplish? And if you say beautification, you're gonna lose a lot of points right away. So please remember this is not for beautification. And we also have checks and balances um, in our requirements that make sure that we are putting um, trees on the landscape that will re reach mature heights of 40 feet or more, because those are the trees, you know, the canopies that actually provide the most benefit. So there will be a ranking committee um, made up of myself and my supervisor and some of the council members who will be reviewing all the applications and ranking them. So areas with canopy cover loss due to weather, insect diseases will rank the highest and riparian restoration activities will also rank really high. And we want to know who will be planting the trees and who will be maintaining the trees. And this is because we want to ensure the highest survival possible. You know, if you say I'm gonna have 60 volunteers plant 250 trees, you know, uh, we provide specifications on how to plant the trees, but we really would uh, require someone super, supervising that, you know, if it is with volunteers that they're trained. And like I said, um, we provide specifications on how to plant the trees and that brochure is in the information packet. And then we want to know where the trees will be planted. And so, um, component of this grant is the tree inspection. So we need to know where the trees are located. I don't necessarily need a dot for each and every single tree, but I do need a relative, you know, location. 40 trees were planted at this park, you know. And planting maps can be a Google Earth image with your locations marked or block numbers with street addresses but I would uh, highly recommend having a physical address so that the site can be located later on. And this is just an image of proper procedure for tree planting has changed a lot in the years. There's a lot of um, science going on in the urban field and a lot of advancements are being made in the urban forestry field. And so staking is no longer recommended unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, I think in sandy soils, you know, it may be a little more difficult, but I think in our clay soils in Tennessee, generally, if you seat the tree correctly in the hole and you backfill it correctly, you should not need to stake it. And also, you know, they say to cut the wire basket and peel the burlap back from the top ever how far away from, you know, which um, they're finding that that burlap really isn't rotting and going away as fast as they thought it did. So if it's possible, I recommend going ahead and removing that basket and removing that burlap. And then uh, on the left, you see a picture of Arbavati uh, that were planted with the tape grant. And that's the important of the inspections because uh, one of the fellows thought that the other fellow removed the ropes and that fellow thought that the other fellow removed the ropes and actually no one did and no one checked. So it's a good thing that I caught that because that would have been a large waste of money and a lot of dead trees. So there are a few additional questions um, on the grant that have uh, historically not been on the grant. And this is our effort to um, reach, reach more communities, reach more towns, 
and uh, to be able to um, report this in our federal reporting at the end of the year. So we want to know, uh, does your city or town have a tree board or a tree commission? And then this is done to ensure that in case of employee turnover, someone is aware of and will adhere to the deadlines for the grant. And then the citizen oversight committee, um, if you don't have a tree board or tree commission, you can appoint three people or more to a citizen oversight committee. And once again, that's to make sure that um, people are aware of the grant. And then I talked earlier about the acknowledgement signs and we want to know how you're gonna acknowledge those grant funds that are provided. And then that's just a blanket statement. You know, it was completed by in collaboration with you know, by the Department of Agriculture Forestry. And so if you want to put a sign at your planting uh, location, that's fine. If you want to put that on your website or post it in public uh, buildings, that's fine also. And then we want to see an estimate from a Tennessee nursery. Now we know uh, we, we require that Tennessee grown trees be used for the TAPE grant. And we also know that the estimate, if you are applying for this grant in May and you're not getting the trees until November, there will be um, price changes sometimes and there will be changes in availability. So I recommend that you don't just um, chain yourself to your species list, uh, come up with a backup plan, you know, and alternate species that you, if the ones, that you want aren't available, then what you will take. And so um, the estimate from the nursery is just to show that you are in fact buying Tennessee grown trees. It is not the um, bottom line cost of what the project's gonna be. And then uh, there are items in the checklist in the application package. There's about six of them. And so make sure that you have all of those items that we asked for attached and um, accounted for for the application because um, if, if it's incomplete, then that's gonna, you're gonna lose some points on your ranking. And then in an effort to um, fund and reach out and um, touch more towns and communities. We want to know if your city or organization received a TAPE grant last year, so that if I have um, requests that, that are more than the funds I have, then I'm more likely to give those funds to uh, the new applicants rather than the ones who successfully apply year after year. And, but I do, Appreciate those people who successfully apply year after year because y'all do a good job and I know who you are. So we wanna know, is this the first time your organization has applied for the grant? And then um, grantees who received TAPE grants in the past will not be ranked quite as high. And then grantees who applied last year, but funds were insufficient. Uh, we're gonna put you know, some buffer in there for you guys too. So like I said, trees grown in Tennessee must be used for the grant. We have a soil and a site form that must be included. We have a spreadsheet of the trees to be planted and other costs that must be included. And that spreadsheet is separate from the application because of changes that sometimes and oftentimes need to be made. And it's much easier for me to deal with an Excel sheet than a PDF document. We also have the watering and maintenance forms be included and trees will be planted according to the specifications provided by us. And trees that do not reach a mature height of 40 feet can only compromise 25% of the total planting project. And this is one that I'd like to spend just a minute on because um, I'm looking at the species, oh, the ranking committee is looking at 
the trees that you supposed to plant and then you know fringe trees out it doesn't even reach 20 feet so trees that don't reach mature heights of 20 feet will not be funded uh dogwoods red buds they're beautiful but they're really not uh, providing that mature canopy that we need so if you say you're going to plant oaks and um you know, dogwood and whatever, and then you can't get those other hardwood trees and you go, oh, well, we'll just plant a bunch of redbud. Well, then you're violating that, you know, tenant in the contract. So just be careful uh, about that particular part of the grant. And then there are certain trees, species of trees that we just will not fund at all. That doesn't mean you can't grow them. That just means that we won't help pay for those. So obviously the emerald ash borer, the green and white ash, and a lot of our other ash are susceptible. The Leland cypress is susceptible to ceridium canker. Uh, hemlock, obviously, because of the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I don't believe there's a whole lot of areas in Tennessee that you could successfully grow hemlock anyway, unless you're in Upper East Tennessee. The silver maple is just an undesirable urban species, and that is a picture in the top right that you can see uh, in someone's front yard. It had green leaves on it, but it looked horrible. I mean, it was diseased and infected and rotten, and it just, it looked horrible. And I actually feel bad that I didn't knock on those people's front door because I passed by that tree over and over again. And then the day I came by and it had fallen over, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm glad it didn't hit their house because I knew it was a goner. And like I said, I just wished I'd gone and knocked on their door and said, hey, that tree is bad, people. But anyway, the American elm, the threat of Dutch elm disease, uh, resistant varieties can be used. And mostly it was a Princeton elm. And now, however, the Princeton elm are being highly susceptible to the elm yellows, which is another disease. And then the Bradford pear, uh, undesirable urban species, highly, highly invasive. And then I've had questions about pin oak. Uh, in the urban world, it was planted a lot a long time ago. I'm not seeing a whole lot of people planting them now. They're still a nice tree, but they are susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch. And then another new part of our TAPE grant, which um, just has come about in the past few years, is that bare, bare root seedlings can be a component of the tree planting grant for riparian restoration projects. And like I said, riparian restoration projects will rank high. And if you have that project coupled with a no mow zone, that is going to really, really rank up there because. Uh, in our cities and towns, you know, these streams are mainly degraded. We loss of natural habitat, uh, erosion and floods, and we just need to get trees back along those riparian areas. And this is actually a picture of our East Tennessee nursery in Delano. We would like for you to buy the bare root seedlings from our state nursery, but it, that is not a requirement of the grant, as long as they're grown in Tennessee. And so that is our East Tennessee Nursery in Delano, Tennessee. That's by the Hiawassee River. And you can see the Cherokee National Forest in the background. It's a beautiful place if you ever get a chance to visit. And then speaking of that riparian project, uh, this is a before and after picture actually from Clarksville. And they applied for the Tate Grant and they were going to plant bald and burlap trees and they mentioned erosion. And I said, well, a better way to address that erosion is to put those bald and burlap trees in there and along the edge, but fill all that space up with bare root seedlings. Just plant as many as you can pop in there and stop mowing it. Obviously, there's going to be invasive, you know, non-native plants that will come in there, but hopefully you can get a handle on it. And if you plant it really, really heavy, you may be able to crowd out and uh, shade out those invasive plants before uh, you know they get really established. 
So this, I think, is just, it tells a beautiful story to me. It's a wonderful uh, use of our TAPE grant, and I'm really proud of that. Thank you, Clarksville. So last year, uh, 16 projects were funded for a total of 15,657 trees. Obviously, those weren't all bald and burlap. There, there were some bare root seedlings, 2,000 maybe, I can't remember exactly. But I had uh, almost $200,000 of proposals and I only had $146,000 of grant. So the 145,800 was awarded for increasing urban tree canopy. And that was largely, <clears throat> excuse me, in Middle Tennessee due to the tornadoes that we had in 2020. So the planting, uh, whenever I made this, I said that it was underway or completed, but pretty much it's all completed. So the contract start date for the next tape contract is 1 November 2021. The contract ends 30 April 2022. There is a complete timeline in the information package. Um, we do require that bare root seedlings must have been planted by the end of March and that bald and burlap trees must have been planted uh, before 15 April. And all of those details are in the information package. The maximum is $20,000. So if you have a $40,000 project, the 50-50 match would be 20,000. And the minimum is 500. And then I'm just gonna talk just a second about some of the tools that I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, that's all right. So, um, the iTree tool is a very um, good tool for communities. When we think about our towns and our cities and we talk about infrastructure, we think about buildings and streets, sewer and lights, you know, but actually all of these trees are our green infrastructure and they play important parts in our communities as well. And so uh, when you have a storm, and your infrastructure is damaged, you may be eligible uh, for reimbursement for FEMA funds. And if your community or town has a, an inventory and a management plan and you have listed these trees as assets for your city, then you can um, actually be reimbursed for the trees that you lost in these um, events. So the iTree tools are for assessing and managing your community forest. And uh, the very most important thing is to have your tree inventory because you don't know what you have until you inventory it. And then there, there are programs where you can punch in those numbers um, depending on the species and the size of the tree. It will calculate for you how much carbon it intercepts, how much rainwater it intercepts, how much um, oxygen it provides, how many pollutants it takes out of the air. Really cool, um, really cool the advancement, advancements in urban forestry. And then the urban forestry strike team is uh, the arm that works to help communities receive that federal uh, assistance. Oftentimes a tornado comes through and the people who come to do the cleanup, regardless of whether the tree is a hazard or not, they just go ahead and take everything down. They're removing stumps and, and debris and trash and broken limbs and trunks. And a lot of times they just go ahead and they take everything out. And that's what the strike theme is for. Are there, um, viable healthy trees that can be retained in those areas because we all know when we uh, have a canopy loss like that it's it's emotional you know and so if we can help you retain as many of those trees that are healthy and don't pose a hazard then that's what the urban forestry strike team would like to do and finally if your city or town isn't a tree city I would encourage you to go to Arbor Day Foundation website and learn more about these programs. 
These programs not only promote the benefits of trees, but they promote the proper management and maintenance of those urban forest resources. And more importantly, they provide recognition to those people who do uh, properly manage and maintain those urban forest resources. And this is the link to the application uh, information about the TAPE grant. Um, that will take you to the urban section of our website. Then if you scroll down, it's like half a page or a page down, scroll down to program resources. And then you'll find all the TAPE application and information there. And finally, I have been asked whenever I give any kind of talk for you to please participate in the satisfaction survey. So if you have a, an iPhone and you're able to um, point at that QR code, it will take you to the survey. Once again, that's short and sweet, like three, four questions, and that does it. And then finally, remember that without trees, hammocks would just be blankets on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. And if um, any of our audience members have questions, um, please start queuing those up uh, while people gather their thoughts. Diane, we have a few questions in the chat. Who can my organization contact for more information or if we have questions? That's me. Okay, that's you. <laughs> um, Diane, do you mind popping your email in the chat box one more time just so people have that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Next question, how important is it to involve the local community in our tree planting projects? Very important. It's, I think I did that right. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get my type and talk at the same time. <laughs> yes, that's perfect. Um, yes, especially when we're talking about those underserved neighborhoods, the poorer communities, you know, um, that is crucial to get them on board, to get as many partners as you can, not necessarily volunteers, but just partners who are aware of the project, who want to be involved in the project. And then the more hands-on that you have with the project, the more sense of ownership that these people have, and then they take pride in it and they want to see it be successful. And they drive by there and they say, look at these trees that I helped plant. And then they bring their children there and then their children bring their children there. And so it's like a pebble in a pond. It's a ripple effect. And so that is especially the more partners you can have, the better your application is going to rank and the better your project's going to turn out. Great, thank you. And our, our final question from the chat is, how do we get a copy of the information packet that you're referring to, Diane? Um, it is on that website. Let me go back to my presentation and I'll copy that and put it in the chat. Okay, great. While Diane's doing that, does anyone else have any other questions? You can type them in the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself. That one slide I added later, so, whoops. I, I have a quick question. I just want to confirm that the, the information is due in November or when is it, when is the application due? The application is due June 7. Oh. Oh, but the planting time is November too. Correct. Now, let me find the chat again. Uh, okay, there it is. The application, the grant information and all the associated tree lists and soil site form and all that is on that website. Um, do you mind sharing your screen, Diane?
I put it on in the chat. Oh, okay, gotcha. There we go. Any final questions? Okay, well, Neil, would you like to wrap us up? Uh, absolutely, and uh, let me thank Diane for an excellent presentation, uh, which I think makes a huge difference in our communities. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a tree person, but uh, we need every tree we can get in our cities because they do so much good to improve our quality of life. And what I love about, uh, I guess, summarizing your talk and the concept of this program is that you are looking for project proposals that plant the right tree in the right place, the right way, at the right time and for the right purpose. Exactly. There you go. And uh, that's, there's an educational component to this folks uh, because I think this program is also designed to help teach us the best way of uh, installing trees in our communities for the most maximum benefit. So anyway, that was fantastic. Thank you, Diane. And this uh, recording is being recorded and uh, I know I'm going to be sending a link uh, to my tree board contacts the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council has and our municipal foresters. And I would encourage those of y'all that are inclined to do so to help us spread the word as well. Uh, Christy, do we have some uh, closing slides here? Um, I know yes. you've spent a lot of time creating these and this is a final closeout. Uh, to remind you of the groups that are behind this. Uh, I think it's important that we let you know that there are organizations that are working together in many ways to improve our community forest. Uh, and those are some of the people that, that are involved in putting this together. It's been a great group of people. Uh, and as far as our next uh, webinar, uh, if you look at that bottom line and, and look at one of the screens of Joe Allen uh, working at her desk right now, she is going to be our next speaker on May 20th. These are always try to get these on the third Thursday of each month at 11 a.m. Central Time, noon uh, e uh, Eastern Standard Time. And she's going to talk to us and teach us how to identify trees <laughs> all in an hour. Uh, but she knows she knows what she's talking about, and it's a lifelong process, but uh, she'll teach us the fundamentals and some tips that'll help us do a better job of identifying our trees. And I know this will qualify for ISA certified arborist point, a point. And Joellen, is this going to qualify for uh, anything else? I don't know. I probably not because it's talking about okay. identifying and not spraying or doing anything with pest or diseases. Okay. Well, at least we'll get an ISA certified point on this, uh, which we try to add whenever we can. So once again, thanks folks for sitting through this. You know who to call, Diane, if you have any more questions on the Tate Tree Planting Grant. And if there's anything the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council can do for you or the UT Extension and Forestry and Wildlife, uh, just let us know. And I'm day. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. Just to answer Jenny's question that popped in the chat. Jenny, if you look at the link in blue at the bottom of this page, tiny.utk.edu slash urban-forestry, that's where we post all of our recordings. So by the end of this week, um, this recording will be available at that link. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye, folks. Bye.